Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening engineering students, depending on what time of day you happen to be watching this particular video. Uh, my name is Steve Nightingale, and I'm going to be running the project this year, which is entitled Which Road to Zero? Mature Storage Technologies. The problem that's really defining this project is the fact that when we burn fossil fuels, we produce gases in the Earth's atmosphere which trap the sun's heat. This is known as the greenhouse effect. And this process makes the Earth warmer and causes significant changes in weather patterns. And I'm sure we've all seen in the news or experienced directly these effects. And I believe it's happened much more rapidly than climate scientists have predicted. The reaction to this by governments throughout the world has been to look to do something about it and some are more active than others and in April this year the UK government announced a revised and extremely ambitious climate change target to reduce emissions from fossil fuels by 78% by 2035 compared with the levels in 1990 and the initial focus of this based on an earlier document called the Road to Zero, was focused on road transport, in particular cars and vans. Hence there's a very strong push to move more to an electric and possibly or partially towards a hydrogen economy in the future. The result of this is that there's been an increased use of acceptable green renewable, renewable energy systems to produce electricity. And the dominant ones here are wind and solar energy in the form of farms where you have a number of solar panels or uh, wind farm generators. However, the intermittency of these technologies as sources of electricity produces a very strong demand for efficient, cost-effective high capacity energy storage systems. And one of the things that you may have seen in the literature is that I believe the current position is that 48% of our electricity requirements could be produced from renewable energies. And by that they mean primarily wind and solar energy farms. However, these figures are a little misleading in that this is the capability or the installed capacity of wind and solar energy farms when they're working in an optimal fashion. So this means that a wind farm has got the wind blowing optimally and similarly with a solar energy farm the sun is shining in an optimal fashion. In practice the amount of energy generated by these farms is about 25 percent for a wind farm and about 15% for a solar energy farm. And the main reasons why you can't get a much higher percentage of installed capacity is because not only does the wind not blow optimally all the time and the sun not shine optimally all the time, but also there are times when you can't make use of the energy because enough is being generated by power stations. So you can improve the situation by having energy storage systems, but you can't get it up to its full installed capacity level. Now these intermittent um, energy sources um, in turn produce an additional requirement, or perhaps I should say with the battery technologies available and what people have become used to, there's an increasing requirement for rapid charge and discharge cycles of energy storage systems. For example with a car one of the main criticisms has been you can't charge a battery at a service station fast enough. Well with some of the newer battery technologies you can for example charge a solid state battery based on glass technology. You can charge a 64 kilowatt hour battery in about a minute. But that's a terrific load on the grid and so therefore you need an intermediate storage system to be trickle charged or probably a bit more than trickle charged in order to store enough energy for when a car suddenly wants to top up its battery. 
There are a number of energy storage technologies that we could consider, and I've just listed three here. One is uh, pumped storage hydropower, another is electric batteries, and a third is mechanical flywheels. But as I say, there are others, and I'd like you to look at those too. So pumped storage hydropower, very straightforward. Essentially, you have a power station that's trying to generate the same amount of power over 24 hours. But during low demand, such as at night, excess capacity is used to pump water uphill into a reservoir on a mountain or large hill. And then during the day, when more electricity is required, um, the water is run down to drive uh, a water turbine, driving a generator to augment what the power station is supplying. And so it smooths things out. More recently, of course, we've had companies such as Tesla producing very large lithium ion based um, energy storage systems. And one is at uh, Hornsdale in uh, Australia. And this particular storage system has 194 megawatt hour capacity and you can draw off at 150 megawatts. One of the problems with lithium ion is although it's a well-known technology, it can be made in very small battery units for portable applications, uh, and it operates at room temperature, is the batteries do degrade with time, and also there have been instances of where they catch fire or blow up. There are other alternative energy storage um, systems, but they tend to not be suitable for portable applications. One of these is the sodium sulfur uh, battery, and this runs at several hundred degrees C. Um, so there is a safety issue there, unless, of course, you, you put it, sink it into a bunker or something. Um, it's clearly not suitable for portable systems, or not unless they're extremely large. It may be suitable on ships in the future, for example. One of the things with a sodium sulfur battery is it doesn't suffer from the problems of degradation um, as the number of charge discharge cycles increases. But there are a large number of companies making these kind of storage systems. More recently, there's a company called Ambry that's produced a liquid metal battery energy storage system. It's not quite clear to me exactly what the battery chemistry is, but its uh, storage capacity is very good, much better than lithium ion battery, and that is already in production. So finally, another energy storage system is a flywheel energy storage. And flywheel energy storage has been around for years um, for all sorts of applications. But the one that's relevant here is the one that's been built in Steventown. It's now been operating for about 10 years. This is Steventown in New York. It has 200 flywheels and it can produce about 40 megawatts. One of the problems with the flywheel energy storage system is the losses due to losses in the bearing and windage losses. And these can be overcome by using magnetic bearings and by installing the whole rotating structure in a vacuum. And that is what RevTerra have done. And if we look at the uh, particular system at uh, Steventown that's operated by Beacon Power, uh, they typically have 3,000 to 5,000 full depth charge discharge cycles per year, and there hasn't been any, any degradation in storage capacity like there would have been in many battery based technologies. So that's the project. I'd just like to talk through a few things by way of preparation for the MDDP when we have our weekly meetings. And the first is to make sure that you know how to chair a meeting and take proper formal minutes, not notes. I should say that I've been doing this MDDP activity for 20 years now, and I've found virtually every year, despite me saying to uh, people who are going to be in my teams, find out about how to chair a meeting and to take minutes, uh, they don't and it takes some time to correct things till that they're right. So do go and look that up. Um, I fully appreciate you won't be experienced in this. 
and I will issue some notes to you when I know the people that are going to be in my teams. I strongly suggest you check out information sources in the university library. Don't just rely on online resources. I also suggest that you read the technology sections of quality newspapers such as the Times and Telegraph and that will often tell you about some new developments that have, that have occurred but for more technical detail you may actually go to some other sources but at least it identifies it for you and you can investigate further. I also recommend that you read the house journals of professional organisations uh, for example the um, IEEE uh, engineering organisation they have a house journal called Spectrum. Uh, the IT have a house journal called Engineering and Technology, and the IOP have one called Physics World. There will be other journals too, but it's a good idea to keep an eye on those on a regular basis to see what you can learn from them. So thank you very much, and I look forward to working with you. Bye.